Let us pray the Lord singing to his glory and praise this morning from the words of Psalm 27. Psalm 27, Stephen Campbell, if you would lead this singing, please. Psalm 27, and we're singing from the beginning of the psalm. We're going to sing down to the end of the double verse, or, the, or verse 5. Verse 5 is not actually a double verse. And down to the end of verse 5, uh, verses that speak of God's protection, God's keeping, themes that will appear again and again as we consider God's word this morning. The Lord's my light and saving heaven. Lord, my light and Gracious God, we are thankful today that the words we have sung speaking of the protecting power of God are no mere empty wishful words, but grounded in reality, grounded in David's own experience, and grounded in the experience of the people of God down through the ages. We worship thee, O Lord, today is the one who calls out a people to himself and the one who will guard and keep that people who will bring them to all the trials and difficulties of this life and bring them at last to be with himself we rejoice in the hope of the gospel 
and we rejoice that Christ Jesus is at the center of that hope. Indeed, without him, there is no hope. For he is the one who came into this world in order to die for sinners. We acknowledge eternal Lord that we turn everywhere else in thee, but we turn to him and we find the solution to the power and the curse and the penalty of sin. Christ crucified, our hope and our consolation. Receive us, O Lord, and our worship, for we do offer it in Christ's name, looking to his merits alone, for there are no merits with us. There is nothing that we can bring. Indeed, we must confess our sin, the sins of our heart, the deceitful thoughts that lurk in our souls, our sin in regard to our fellow men, our failure to love them with hearts as we love ourselves, our failure to be free from deceit and wrong thoughts and covetousness and jealousy and coldness. And above all of that, our sins in regard to God. To love the Lord our God with soul, heart, mind, strength. And we have not even begun, even today, to reach that height or anywhere near it. Even today, the, the law is broken in our hands. It's a holy day, but we are not holy people. And we come to a holy God. We come trusting in the shed blood of Christ to procure pardon trusting in his righteousness to cover our unrighteousness. And so we come praying for the Lord's people, strengthen them and guard them and keep them even as David was guarded. And give them grace, Lord, to live as the redeemed of the Lord. Grace to live clear, consistent, God-honoring lives speaking powerfully to God's work in them and to God's power in them through the Spirit. We pray, Lord, for those who are searching, questioning, wondering, troubled, unsettled. We pray, Lord, that they would be led to the light that is Christ. He is the light of the world. Go in and Indeed, sweep into the fold of the good shepherd, those sheep that are astray, some of them so seriously astray, astray for a long time, astray all their days and going further astray. Grant, Lord, that even today they would be called with that glorious effectual calling of God's spirit, that they would hear the voice of the Lord speaking to them, to come to him those who are laboring and heavy laden, to come to the water and drink freely, like the woman of Samaria and the people of that city who found that well of water that Jesus spoke of, which wells up to everlasting life. We pray thy blessing, Lord, upon our kith and kin, our families and loved ones, whether at home or away, we pray for those who are unwell. We hear even today of some unwell, connected with our families and connected with our people. We commit them, Lord, to thyself. We pray for help, strength where there is weakness, and medical guidance where there is confusion and uncertainty. Remember, Lord, those who know bereavement and other sorrows and troubles in their lives, bless these things to them. Remember our denomination, we pray for it, for our differing congregations up and down the land and in different parts of the world. We pray for the mission work in Sri Lanka. We commit all that is done there to thyself. We pray for the... 
uh, missionary interests that we have in other parts of the world. We think of the work of Christian Witness to Israel, the work of the Middle East Reform Fellowship, and countless other missionary organizations known to us. We pray for those involved in the translation of Scripture and in the distribution of the Word of God. Open doors and open hearts so that the powers that be in different parts of the world will be moved to encourage the work of mission and encourage to um, uh, uh, encourage to encourage it and to strengthen it. And indeed that those who are opposed to it and suspicious of it will themselves be worked on by the spirit of God in such a way that they become those who help the work of the gospel. The Lord is able to do wonderful things. And with that, we come with a certain confidence and a certain hope in our prayer. We pray, Lord, for our nation. We pray for those who govern us. We suspect that in many cases, prayer is not something they are interested in. Show them, O oh Lord. Show all of us. Show this nation of ours. That without the Lord at our helm, success and progress will be very frail and very limited and very fragile. If it is built on man and his thinking and his ideas and his solutions, turn us, Lord, to the one who is the answer to every dilemma and of whom COVID and a multitude of other issues speak and turn our gaze toward him. Be with us now, Lord, as we come. We confess our need of the Spirit of God, its power to accompany the singing and the reading and especially the preaching of the word. Draw near to us, Lord. Fix our attention upon the word and upon the Christ of the word. And fill our hearts with praise and wonder, with humble confession and with contrition. Fill us with Christ and make him exceeding precious and pardon all our sins for Jesus' sake. Amen. We're going to read together now in God's word, and we're going to return this morning to our studies in 1 Samuel. And when we last considered this part of God's word together, we were considering chapter 18, and that brings us this morning to the 19th chapter. The, um, the Old Testament scriptures, the first book of Samuel, and reading at chapter 19. And we're taking up our reading at that point in the narrative where Saul has begun now even openly to turn against David and to persecute and pursue him. And Saul spake to Jonathan his son and to all his servants that they should kill David. But Jonathan, Saul's son, delighted much in David. And Jonathan told David, saying, Saul, my father, seeketh to kill thee. Now therefore, I pray thee, take heed to thyself till the morning, and abide in a secret place, and hide thyself. And uh, I will go out. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> oh, my throat. <coughs> I will go out and stand beside my father in the field <clears throat> where thou art, and I will commune with my father of thee. What I see, that I will tell thee. <clears throat> Jonathan spake good of David unto Saul his father, and said unto him, Let not the king sin against his servant, against David, because he hath not sinned against thee, and because his works have been to thee were very good. But he did put his life in his hand and slew the Philistine. And the Lord wrought a great salvation for all Israel. How saw it and did rejoice. 
Wherefore then wilt thou sin against innocent blood to save David without a cause? And Saul hearkened to the voice of Jonathan, and Saul swore, as the Lord liveth, he shall not be slain. And Jonathan called David, and Jonathan showed him all those things, and Jonathan brought David to Saul, and he was in his presence as in <clears throat> times past. And there was war again. And David went out and fought with the Philistines, and slew them with a great slaughter, and they fled from him. And the evil spirit from the Lord was upon Saul as he sat in his house with a javelin in his hand, and David played with his hand, he played his harp. We've spoken about this already, this matter of the evil spirit being described as having come from the Lord. We've got to remember that Saul was now a man under judgment and God's protection from the workings of evil had been removed. He is now left and exposed in a very serious and solemn way. And uh, if um, uh, wicked spirits try to work on him and use him, uh, the Lord's protection is, is, has been removed. He is now left exposed to some of these things. Verse 10, and Saul smote, sought to smite David even to the wall with the javelin. But he slipped away out of Saul's presence and he smote the javelin into the wall, and David fled and escaped that night. Saul also sent messengers to David's house to watch him and to slay him in the morning. And Michal, David's wife, told him, saying, Thou save not thy life tonight, tomorrow thou shalt be slain. So Michal let David down through a window, and he went and fled and escaped. And Michael took an image and laid it in the bed and put a pillow of God's goat's hair for his bolster and covered it with a cloth. These images would have been, it's, it's probably what they called a teraphim. And they were used actually in idol worship. And it raises a huge question what Michael was doing with such images anyway. But she puts it in the bed and it's, it's a sort of dummy to fool anybody who looks in. And when Saul sent messengers to take David, she said, he is sick. And, David, and Saul sent the messenger again to see David, saying, bring him up to me in the bed that I may slay him. All Pretense and restraint is now gone from Saul. He says, bring him in the bed. Suppose you have to carry him in the bed. Bring him here. I will kill him myself. And when the messengers were come in, behold, there was an image in the bed with a pillow of goat's hair for his bolster. And Saul said to Michael, why hast thou deceived me so and sent away mine enemy that he is escaped? And Michael answered Saul. He said to me, let me go. Why should I kill thee? Uh, scripture here records her lies and deception. Doesn't commend it, obviously. Just records it as a matter of fact. And uh, she resorts, I'll touch on this later on, but she resorts to lying in different ways. Here in verse 17, she's, she's effectively saying, well, you know, what a brute he is. He would have killed me if I hadn't helped him, which was, of course, not true at all. The very opposite was true. But anyway, that was her solution. We'll touch on that later. Verse 18. So David fled and escaped and came to Saul, to, to Samuel, to Ramah, and told him all that Saul had done to him. How that must have broken Samuel's heart. And he and Samuel went and dwelt in Nile. And it was told Saul, saying, Behold, David is at Nioth in Ramah. And Saul sent messengers to take David. And when they saw the company of the prophets prophesying, now prophesying there really means worshipping and praising the Lord more than foretelling. And Samuel standing as appointed over them. The spirit of God was upon the messengers of Saul and they also prophesied and worshipped and praised. And when it was told Saul, he sent other messengers and they prophesied likewise. 
And Saul sent messengers again the third time, and they prophesied also. Then he went also to Ramah and came to a great well that is in Sechu, and he asked and said, Where are Samuel and David? And one said, Behold, they be at Naioth in Ramah. And he went thither to Naioth in Ramah, and the Spirit of God was upon him also, not in a good way, not in a saving way, not by way of blessing, but um, simply leaving him incapacitated, unable to do what he wants to do. And he went thither to Naioth, to Ramah, and the Spirit of God was upon him also. And he went on and prophesied until he came to Naioth in Ramah. He too is rendered helpless by the powerful hand of God. And he stripped off his clothes also and prophesied before Samuel in like manner and lay down naked all that day and all that night. Wherefore, they say, is Saul also among the prophets. He's thrown into a sort of trance here. And uh, David flees. Uh, the chapter ends with a question, is Saul among the prophets? Was this any spiritual utterance? Not at all. It was worship, but it was a sort of, well, I was going to say forced worship. That's, that's not true, but um, in a way it is. He is he's in the hand of God, and he, he, he's turned whichever way the Lord turns him. God subduing him, God sending his spirit and power. The question is asked, of course, is Saul also among the prophets? The answer, as we saw some chapters back, is emphatically, no, he's not. He's not. Well, we trust the Lord to follow with his blessing uh, that reading of his word. I was going to read the first verse of the next chapter, actually, and I forgot, so I'll do it now. And David fled from Naioth and Rama and came and said before Jonathan, what have I done? What is mine iniquity? What is my sin before thy father, that he seeketh my life? Well, may the Lord indeed follow with his blessing, that reading of his truth. We turn now to Psalm 59. Now, Psalm 59 is an interesting psalm. We're going to sing from verse 12. Alistair, would read the singing, please. Psalm 59 and from verse 12. But... Can I draw your attention to the title above the psalm? It's a psalm of David, we're told there, when Saul sent and they watched the house to kill him. So this psalm was composed as a result of the events we read of in the middle of the chapter when Saul sent his um, uh, henchmen, his hitmen, really, to David's house in order to... Um, assassinated in the morning and he begins the psalm with these words my god deliver me from those that are mine enemies and do thou me defend from those that up against me rise then we see in verse three for lo they for my soul may wait the mighty do combine against me lord not for my fault nor any sin of mine they run and without fault in me themselves do ready make Awake to meet me with thy help, and do thou notice take. Then he goes on to speak of God's protection, and then solemnly he says to the Lord, you know, if they don't repent, then remove them, Lord, and work powerfully and solemnly and <coughs> even in judgment. We're reading at verse 12 now, for their mouths sin, and for the words that from their lips do fly, let them be taken in their pride because they curse and lie and wrath consume them, them consume that so they may not be and that in Jacob's God doth rule to the end, to the earth's ends, let them see. He's saying, Lord, if they, if they don't repent, if they don't return, then there's only judgment left. There's nothing else. Then in verse 14, he, he wants them to, to be thrown into a measure of confusion, which is exactly what happened with Saul and his messengers. At evening let thou them return, making great noise and sound like to a dog, and often walk about the city round. He's thinking here of the 
The, the wild scavenging city dogs, let them wander up and down and seeking food to eat and let them grudge when they shall not be satisfied with meat. Let them be disappointed. Let them be confounded. He said, they're like wild dogs at my heels. Don't let them be fed, Lord. Don't let them be strong. Let them be weak and incapacitated. Let them be disappointed and confounded. Because my life, he says, hangs in the very balance. And then verse 16, but of thy power I'll sing aloud. At morn thy mercy praise. For thou to me my refuge wast and tower and troublous days. O God, thou art my strength. I will sing praises unto thee, for God is my defense, a God of mercy unto me. We're singing from 12 for their mouths. And... For their mouths.
when seeking the light of God's Spirit, we turn again to that passage in God's Word that we read together, the first book of Samuel in chapter 19. And we read at verse 1, And Saul spake to Jonathan his son, and to all his servants, that they should kill David. Well, when we last considered this part of God's word, some four or five weeks ago now, maybe more, we saw in the 18th chapter, the beginning of Saul's jealousy towards David. And jealousy is a terrible and a dangerous thing. And in Saul's case, it eventually boils up to become a murderous rage. And as we read through this chapter this morning, we saw Saul's irrational, spiteful jealousy develop a new and a dangerous head. It's placated for a little time, and we'll see that in a moment. But that doesn't last very long because a fresh bout of anger is stirred up in verse 8 by some fresh military success for David. And no doubt, as we saw in a previous section, the people praise David and Saul just can't abide to hear that at all. But the situation is now more complicated for everyone than it was in chapter 18. Because David is now married, as we saw in the chapter, to Michal, Saul's daughter. So David is not only his trusted army leader and his old confidant, he is also now his son-in-law. Now, there are two major themes that run through the chapter and interweave one with the other, and I would like this morning to look at both these themes. And the two themes are simply this. They are protection and persecution. We have, first of all, God's protection of David, and we'll see the way that that works out in several different a directions. We have God's protection of David. But then the other theme that runs alongside that is Saul's persecution of David. Protection and persecution. And in a sense, we have there in a nutshell what the Christian church faces every day of its existence to some greater and sometimes lesser extent. There is always a measure of difficulty and persecution because there are spiritual forces at work utterly opposed to the gospel and to the work and power of God's spirit that would annihilate and destroy it uh, completely. And yet running along at the same time, how mercifully so, is the protection and the overworking of God. So we have here uh, an incident of Old Testament history full of lessons for us, but we have also something that is replicated and repeated in the history of the church generally, yes, and in the experience of the Lord's people individually eh, down through the ages. Well, we begin then with God's protection of David. Now, the Lord protects all his people, but David had a particular a claim, if that is the right word, it's probably not, but it's the one that's come to my mind, a particular claim on the Lord's protection or a particular position, perhaps that might be the better way to put it, a particular position which called for God's protection. David, after all, wasn't merely just a, a private citizen and a believer in the Lord. He was all of these things, but he was also the Lord's anointed. 
He was the one whom God himself had set apart to be king. And God had decreed that David would succeed Saul. God had decreed that as the wheels of history went around from about the year 1010 BC, David would begin to reign in Israel. And that he would be the father of the mighty King Solomon. And that indeed he would be the head of a royal and political dynasty that would last for many, many generations. All of that was involved in David's protection. And the Lord protects David and he does so in several different ways. I want us to notice just two things about this protection. First of all, he is able to do it naturally and supernaturally. God can protect his church, his people, naturally and supernaturally. He does it here, first of all, naturally. He uses ordinary means to protect David. We have the intervention of Jonathan, who tries to guard his friend. And then later we have the rather muddled and mixed intervention of David's wife, who again tries and succeeds actually in saving his life. God is able to protect his people naturally, just through ordinary events, through ordinary people speaking and acting. And the Lord is able to channel that to his own ends. But he's not limited to natural means. And when the situation calls for it, supernatural means can be brought into play. And we see that later on in the chapter. When Saul and his henchmen are overcome, as we saw in our reading, by the power of God's spirit, so that they are rendered helpless, unable to capture David. And God, in that way, protects his own. He's able to do it naturally and supernaturally. And if you are the Lord's and if you feel vulnerable at times, and if you're the Lord's, you will feel vulnerable at times. You remember this. He is able to use natural and even supernatural means to guard and keep his own. He is never at a loss. He's able to do it naturally and supernaturally, but we see, secondly, that he is also able to use good people and not so good people. We're reminded here of the sovereign purposes and work of God. We're reminded here of how powerfully he can work in any given situation. He's able to use good people like Jonathan. And Jonathan is a, a, a remarkable person. He comes out so well in this whole narrative. Not just his natural kindness and loyalty, but I do believe his spiritual discernment and his submission to the will of God. But it can't have been easy for Jonathan. We, we think of Jonathan and we say, well, yes, he, he comes out so well out of this, but it must have been difficult for him. Jonathan had to choose. No doubt he was pulled both ways. The ties of flesh and blood. He is, after all, a, a good son, as well as a good friend. He's pulled both ways. But he chooses and he sticks to his choice. Maybe, my friend, I should pause there and say, maybe you are pulled two ways as well. Maybe, Christian, you are pulled two ways on a particular issue, right and wrong. Choose wisely, choose well, and stick with it. Maybe, maybe you're not a believer, but you are pulled two ways. But you also have to choose. Choose who you will serve. Choose which direction you will go in. Choose what it's going to be. And... Make your choice and make it well and make it quick and stick with it. 
but I've wondered somewhat from my point. He is able to use good people like Jonathan, of course he is, but he's also able to use others. We see in the, in the narrative here that he's able to use Michael. Now she's a different character to her brother. Michael has a lot of her father about him. And as the narrative unfolds, and we'll see this in the coming chapters, you begin to suspect with Michael that the apple hasn't fallen very far from the tree. But on this occasion, at least she is ready to help her husband. In the middle of the chapter, Saul, desperate by now, resorts to sending hitmen who will, uh, who will, uh, uh, who, who will uh, uh, deal with the problem and who will sort out the situation. He thinks, well, I'll send somebody and in the morning we will deal with um, uh, David and he will be killed. Presumably he doesn't try to do it in the night in case his own daughter is hurt in the process. Michael somehow learns of her father's plan. We don't know how, maybe she spotted them outside hiding. Maybe somebody said something to her. She would have our connections in the palace, of course. But in any case, she arranges David's escape. She arranges David's escape. Now, she arranges David's escape, as we saw in our reading, through a series of lies. She says, uh, first of all, oh, he's, he's sick. He can't come out today. And then when that is shown to be nonsense and Saul's soldiers discover um, the dummy in the bed, she says, well, he forced me. He forced me. He, I, um, my back was to the wall, Father, and, and you know what he's like. And uh, I, I had no choice. Well, she meant well. She meant well credit where it is due at that level. But as we're going to discover with Michael in the coming chapters, she is not a true believer in the Lord. Michael is a worldly woman. And all she has are worldly solutions, worldly answers. Jonathan is quite different. And doesn't this remind us and put into sharp focus for us the need of a new heart? The need of a new heart. We need more than wisdom and the ability to get through life. How often the word of God confronts us with a need for a new heart. Michael says, I need to be cleverer and sharper and, and smarter. No, Michael. You need to be changed by the Spirit of God so that you will turn to the Lord and trust in the Lord, not in your own plans and in your own trickery and in your own schemes. You need a new heart. And if she needed it, we all need it. And I'll say more about that in just a moment. But you know, there is a danger at work in all of this that Michael will say, well, at least I do good things. I may not be a true believer in the Lord. I, I may not know the Lord, but at least I help God's people. I, I help David. Surely that counts for something. It's a very subtle one, isn't it? Very, very subtle. I'm all right because I do good things. And it's basically a works religion, which we fall back on there. No, we are not all right because we do good things. And back to what I was talking about two minutes ago, we need a new heart and we need peace with God through the finished work of Christ. We need Christ himself as our savior and our redeemer and our Lord and our deliverer. And no amount of good things is going to compensate for the absence of that. You must, says Jesus to Nicodemus, after all, be born again. What is Born of the flesh is flesh at the end of the day. And what is born of the spirit is spirit. So we have God's protection of David. And in Psalm 59, David 
turns this into, into prayer and into a psalm. And in Psalm 59, if you read it there, you'll discover that um, David turns to prayer. I only had time to read a couple of verses, but he turns to prayer. Is that where you turn in trouble? Is that where you turn when there's no trouble? Michael relies on deception, on being just clever enough to stay one step ahead. The contrast is so clear. David in Psalm 59 looks to the Lord. She's just looking to herself and hoping it's enough to get by. But through God's intervention, David is protected and each plot fails. The Lord will guard those who trust him. And incidentally, Taking longer on this than I intended, but I'll make this point and then I leave it. Incidentally, David, as we've seen, wrote Psalm 59 as a result of all of this. And Psalm 59, in so many ways, reminds us of Christ. The whole situation has shadows of the New Testament and of Christ in it. The more David is pursued by Saul, the more the people turn to him. And it was the same with the Lord himself. The more he was pursued and persecuted by the authorities, the more, at least for a time, the people turned to him and sought after. And in both cases, of course, the authorities plot his death. And in all the, in both cases, the plots fail. Saul's messengers, they return empty handed. <laughs> the authorities send, send to arrest Jesus, isn't it, in John 7? And they return empty handed. Never man spake like this man, they said. They can do nothing until at last he submits himself to them in Gethsemane because the hour and the moment of Calvary has arrived. And he will no longer resist arrest. But until that moment, all their plans fail and collapse. And the great substitution then unfolds on Calvary as he dies in the place of his people. The hour had come. But we better get back to David. We've seen God's protection of David, but we also see running alongside it Saul's persecution of David. Saul pursues David, and it's a sinful pursuit. It's a sinful pursuit. Because it was driven by sinful desires, sinful urges, sinful wants controlled Saul. He's controlled here. It's, it's such a, a pathetic picture. He's, he's king. But he's, he's under the hand of darkness. You know, the whole thing, it's a picture of the way that sin works and grows in the heart of man. Unless and until the Lord comes in power and changes the heart and we're back to our new heart again. David pursues, Saul pursues David. Can I just make three points about that? He does it despite pleadings. He does it despite pleadings. Jonathan pleads with his father. David, he says in verse 4, is good and loyal. 
If he dies, Father, it won't be as a, as a, as a guilty man who deserved to die. He'll die as an innocent man, as an innocent victim. You know, the pleading would, 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 would melt you, would say, any heart. Saul hardens his heart. Hardens his heart to the fact of David's goodness. And he pursues headlong his course. It's so irrational. Sin is basically irrational. And when we remember, friends, that God is good and kind, when we sin, we are doing the same as Saul. We are hardening our hearts against the fact of, God, of God's goodness and kindness. We are hardening our hearts against the pleadings of conscience and the pleadings of God's word. And we repay his kindness and his long suffering with rebellion. Is this how you repay David, Saul? This is shabby payment. But how much more so is our repayment of God? Oh, how well we too can ignore the pleadings, the, the pleadings of our conscience, for example. We, we can silence our conscience when it suits us. We can muffle it, just as, as Saul muffles the pleadings of Jonathan. Take care that you do not muffle your conscience. Because its voice will get less and less. That's how it works. He pursues David despite pleadings. He pursues David, secondly, despite promises. Verse 6. And Saul hearkened to the voice of Jonathan, and Saul swore, Saul promised, as the Lord liveth. He's not shy about bringing the Lord's name into it. As the Lord liveth, he shall not be slain. Well, that's verse 6. You just have to reach verse 10. The promise is gone. He breaks his promise. Because sin's power was unbroken in his life. And the old desires come back. And they overwhelm him. And his good intentions are drowned. By the sheer wave of, of sin that floods over his heart. And it overpowers him. He intended to keep his promise. I, I don't think verse 6 is just a show. He intended to keep his promise, and so did you. But he lacked the new heart, and he lacked God's keeping power, which the Christian, of course, has. I'm not saying the Christian doesn't fall into sin. Of course they do. Every day of life. But in terms of their keeping, they don't depend on themselves. They don't say, well, I mustn't do it again, and I must... Try really, really hard. No, they come to the Lord and they say, I'll never, ever walk in the way of God unless and except the spirit and power of God keeps and guards me. That's what you depend on, Christian. That's not to say that you sit back and say, well, it doesn't matter what I do or, or, or what I think, God will keep me. Of course not. That's presumption, which is different. But you know that. No, the Christian depends upon God's keeping. And that is totally absent in Saul's case. 
That's why he capitulates so quickly. Because he's captive to his own desires. And that's why you also fall back to your old ways. Maybe you leave them and you, you, you sincerely intend to leave them. It sort of slips back. Well, Saul slips back. The Lord Jesus spoke of the parable of the seeds of the soils and the seed fell among thorns and it grows. But the thorns are still there. And they grow as well and they grow faster. And they choke and the resolutions melt away. If sin's power is unbroken, you will face fresh temptations. They will arise and they will overpower all your good resolutions. And the dormant corruptions will rise up and they'll win the day. Saul's old murderous desires come back. And you notice something, they come back even stronger. Verse 6, as the Lord lives, he shall not die. Verse 10, he's got javelin in his hand. They come back stronger. At the beginning of all of this, Saul isn't so open. It's not so obvious. Even David doesn't suspect it at first. We saw that in a previous chapter. David thinks, well, he just can't help it or whatever. But then eventually David begins to realize this is, this is personal. By the time we reach this chapter, Saul doesn't care who knows. Verse 1, he gives an instruction to his servants that they should kill David. It's not even cloak and dagger. Oh, it begins with secret thoughts that nobody knew. But it doesn't stop there. It grows and it multiplies. It's a portrait of sin in the heart. The thing that Saul would once have been embarrassed and ashamed about, he's now quite open about. And that's the way it is. You will do things, perhaps now, that you would, you would never have done before. You think Saul would be ashamed that folk knew. You'd think he'd be ashamed Samuel knew. You know, when David later on in the chapter goes to see Samuel, you think, well, he won't go that far. He will at least try to cover himself before Samuel. No. He sends officers to arrest Saul at Samuel. And when the three attempts fail, he goes himself. See this in your own life. See, sin isn't just things we do. That's just the outward manifestation of it. It's much deeper than that. It's a principle which has taken root and which has left the human nature in the state that it's in. And every and any solution that tries to deal with man's problem and man's nature that bypasses all of this is doomed to failure. He pursues David despite pleadings, despite promises, thirdly and finally despite warnings. He, he received warnings. He received a warning from, from Jonathan as we saw. David is a good man. It's, it's sinful and wrong for you to behave as you do. And then he gets the big warning at the end of the chapter. Three times he sends his guards to arrest David and bring him back. Three times God stops them in the most astonishing way. And they come home empty handed. Does Saul stop? 
Does he think, well, you know, the Lord is speaking to me here. I'd better just stop this right now. No, in verse 23, what do we read? He went thither to Nioth himself. He ignores the three warnings that God has given. And he goes on headlong. You know, the Lord often warns us, warns us through his word, warns us in the preaching, of the gospel, warns us in providence, things happen and you can just see the hand of God in it. Saul is fighting against God. And so he goes to Ramah. And what, is, what happens? The Lord lays Saul in the dust, powerless. Can't do a thing. The Lord is showing him that he could lay him in the dust at any moment. Just like that. It's a solemn, powerful warning. He's stopped in his tracks, but as we'll see next time, he goes back to his old ways. He picks himself up and dusts himself down. And it's business as usual. And you know in your heart as you read it, this is not going to end well. Despite the warnings, Saul pursues him. He pursues him into his own house. He pursues him into the place of worship. It reminds us of Psalm 2, the hopeless defiance of it all. Despite warnings, and maybe, friend, maybe this is so close to the bone. Maybe you feel that the Lord has spoken to you in warnings and things in the past, and it's the voice of God. I would plead with you, do not do as he does, as Saul does. So we have God's protection of David and Saul's persecution of David. And the two, they run like two streams through the chapter. Chris crossing here and there. But I want to finish on Christ because... That's where everything comes to. And people have commented that Jonathan's intercession for David, it's like Christ's for his people. And people have, some writers have gone quite far down that road. Hmm. Well, my comment is this, although there are some similarities, actually the contrast between the two is more striking than the similarities. Jonathan, after all, is pleading to an unjust king. So he has very limited success. When Christ pleads for his people, he pleads to one who is holy and just. So he has total success. And Jonathan's pleading to an unjust king is on the basis of David's goodness. He says he's, he's basically a good man, but Christ's pleading for his people is not on the basis of their goodness, but on the basis of his goodness. And that too guarantees its success. And Jonathan's success is very limited. Christ's, of course, is not. So what does 1 Samuel 19 say to us? It reminds us of the power of fallen humanity. The need of God's power in the heart. And the need for an intercessor who will have good success. May God bless his word. Let us pray.
Bless thy word, O Lord, we pray. We direct our thoughts to the word and to Christ in the word. And from this passage, draw us to our New Testament, where these things are unfolded all the brighter and all the clearer. Bless us, Lord, this day. Help us to honor it as thy day. And remember all that we have already left in thy care. Cover our sin now. Receive us freely. For Jesus' sake, amen. Can we now sing Psalm 76? And at verse 7, speaks in verse 11 of bowing to the Lord and keeping your promises, which of course Saul didn't do. Speaks in verse 10 of the very wrath of man redounding to God's praise. That's what we see in that whole incident with Saul. Speaks in verse 8 of judgment being heard from heaven and God's voice. Again, that's what we see in this passage. Four verses, 7 through 11. Thou Lord, even thou art he that should be feared. Our Lord, even thou Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion and fellowship of God's Spirit, rest on and abide with you all now and forevermore. Amen.